When I was working in the manuscript room of the British Library, I often coincided with Douglas Chambers. And I was working on my biography, and he was working on Evelyn's letter books. These, co-edited with David Galbraith, were published in 2014 in Toronto. Preparing this talk, I learned of Douglas's recent death, following a long period of bad health. And I'd just like to add that note, because I remember him very fondly for scholarly generosity and congenial company. And to the, to the topic. <laughs> in late 1651, John Evelyn wrote to his wife's uncle from Paris. He was ready to return to England. I shall therefore bring over with me no ambitions at all to be a statesman or meddle with the unlucky interests of kingdoms. A friend, a book, and a garden should be, for the future, per shall, sorry, shall, for the future, perfectly circumscribe my utmost designs. As planned, he was back in England in early 1652. He never left again. As he put it, quotes, he'd run about the world mostly out of my own country, country near 10 years. Remember the picture that I've uh, got up here because I'm, I'm going to refer to it again. Uh, this is Wooten, where he was born in Surrey amongst the Surrey Hills and in the woods. And it is the sort of, um, it's the wallpaper to his life, I suppose, but he hardly lived there. You'll I'll meet it again later. When he ran about, he ran about um, as, um, as best he could in the difficult times of the 1640s. And this is one of his own etchings. His etchings are, um, I, they're very, very valiant. <laughs> they're not utterly successful. Um, this is the best, I think. And if you look hard to the left, you will see his friend, um, Thomas Henshaw, uh, sort of rising out of the rock. You can see a hat if you look hard. Um, and Henshaw was one of several people from that era in his life, which was his sort of intellectual testing ground, I suppose, with whom he stayed in touch for the rest of his life, uh, or nearly to the end of his life, um, part, mostly through the Royal Society. Back home again in 1647, I'm sorry, not back home again yet. In 1647, he'd married the 12-year-old Mary Brown in Paris, where her father, Richard Brown, who was created a baronet in 1649, was still representing the royalist cause. Now, in 1652, she was of age, and together they settled at Say's Court, her family's house since the late 16th century, but desperately run down. Um, this is a, quite a tricky um, map to, <laughs> to discern, uh, but down here, whoops, am I getting a little green light? Should be showing you a little, little hand, I'll walk to it, a little hand-drawn um, uh, picture of Say's Court, the hand being Evelyn's, and of uh, various annotations about it, and that's really the only image we have of uh, Say's court, apart from his idealised views of gardens, which aren't the topic of this talk, I'm sorry to say. Um, he was such a busy man, he's very hard to capture. Mary, although actually English, she was altogether French by upbringing, and her husband, who was strongly Francophile, found themselves pitched into the unknown, they were living discreetly up against the walls of the dockyard. You can see the docks um, coming down there. Um, but, of course, it was in Commonwealth hands. It was not a comfortable place to be. Mary Evelyn's first child, Richard, was born that August, and her mother was there to help her settle into this new and testing life. Hardly six weeks after her grandson's birth, Lady Brown caught a scarlet fever and was buried at St Nicholas in Deptford. In Paris, her husband was left disconsolate, that was Evelyn's term, while her death was felt deeply by the fluctuating expatriate community in Paris that knew her house, their house, the Brown's house, quotes, not only as a hospital, but the asylum to all our persecuted and afflicted countrymen during her 11 years residence there. And that's uh, a quote from Evelyn's diary. <clears throat> 
On the eve of his 32nd birthday that year, Evelyn made his will. The poor condition of the sequestered house to which he soon gained a lease, the desolate gardens and unfavourable settling, unfavourable setting downwind of the City of London, thus in the path of the, quotes, hellish and dismal, it's better with two L's, cloud of sea coal as it blew east, made the couple's marital home remarkably unattractive. They couldn't even glimpse the river. Yet in improving the immediate setting and fabric of Say's Court, starting with a French-style oval garden to replace the existing rude orchard, Evelyn was helping his father-in-law endure what became a cruel, long exile. He was abroad for 20 years. He had enormous affection for Brown, and they shared many enthusiasms, above all gardening. Their letters are a delight, letters between the two of them, which are in the British Library, and which I use quite a lot of in my biography. His father-in-law's unremunerated service to the Crown haunted Evelyn and weighed down the already uncertain family finances. Wooten, which I showed you as the first picture, his treasured Surrey birthplace was in his brother's hands. The family gunpowder mills, now given to brass and wire smelting, metal work at least. Living 30 miles away, he could only visit and advise on planting. On every front, he waited patiently for change. Since, what else could he do, quotes, in this mad and estranged country, but busy himself building, planting, buying, felling, etc., as he wrote to Brown in 1657. In person, John Evelyn may have lived overlooking a working stretch of the Thames, but his mind was in, Par was in France. He was thinking about its architecture and gardening, the manners and elegance of the Parisians, the beauty of the Seine, and the clarity of the air. Comparing Paris and L London, he unfa unfailingly favoured Paris. <laughs> The Commonwealth, having made the English the most miserable of slaves, again a quote from him, was set against an active and illustrious monarchy, which was that of the young King Louis, Louis XIV, Louis XIV. His first original work in 1652 was titled The State of France, but he toiled on, varying between translations and ambitious projects on many topics, while the garden took shape and money as Mary, who was to prove at least his equal, was to observe. The garden took over, gave, gave him status, and it grew outside the windows and on the page as he toiled on with his massive Elysium Britannicum project. This was one of the several grand schemes, encyclopedic schemes, which he never completed and was never printed until very recently. More children were born, not many survived. But in 1658, their glorious boy, the first son, Richard, died. They entered a tunnel of intense shared misery. Never underestimate the death of a child, even at times when so many died. And the tone of Evelyn's writing darkened and on occasion sharpened. The character of England, published in 1659, purported to be a translation of observations by an appalled French visitor on arriving in the country. Sorry, that's too fast. <laughs> I'm going back. This was an outright attack, and he soon removed it from his list of publications, perhaps because it was a rehearsal of material used elsewhere, perhaps to the very word. There. There. <laughs> He laid into the capital as a wooden, northern, artif inartificial, that's a strange word, uh, congestion of houses, with narrow, irregular streets and walled-off fountains. There was no order, no care to make them build with uniformity. Only the portico of St Paul's Cathedral and the banqueting house, both by Inigo Jones, escaped his censure. Evelyn unleashed a tir tirade, London was, a, quotes again, a very ugly town, pestered with hackney coaches and insolent carmen, shops and taverns, noise, and such a cloud of sea coal, as if there be a resemblance of hell upon earth. It is in this volcano in a foggy day, this pestilent smoke which corrodes the very iron and spoils all the movables, 
leaving a soot on all things that it lights, and so fatally seizing on the lungs of the inhabitants that the cough and the consumption spare no man. Use, Evelyn used a mere pamphlet, Fumifugium, on your screen, 1661, to muster his arguments for the immediate attention of the reinstated monarch, and better still, Parliament, now assembled, as he put it. Only vivid language could evoke the deadly predicament of the capital. He divided it, his pamphlet, into three sections. The two latter parts, in particular, offered solutions dealing with the essentials of public health, urban planning, and strategies for improvement. And as it was, London was unfit to be the imperial seat of our incomparable monarch. And he signalled, Fumifujim was not all. His dedication refers to another larger work in progress, which, quotes, I am preparing to present to your majesty, as God shall afford me leisure to finish it. Evelyn was naive and not well attuned to court manners, let alone the monarch. Quotes, a man who will rise at court must begin by creeping on all fours, as Lord Halifax the Tremor put it. But for an instant, the king seemed to have engaged with the topic and the author. His interest in Fumifugium and its topics discussed over a mass breakfast and then a rather select dinner on the royal yacht as it raced from Greenwich to Gravesend and back, allowed Evelyn to entertain the highest of hopes. He was dreaming of royal patronage for himself, but also for his wife, who almost began to, to, to get close to a position within the court. It never happened. But above all, his wife's father and the great aim, which was to settle Sir Richard's enormous debts, which were in the hands of the crown. By his standards, by Evelyn's standards, this is, the message and the measures proposed in these pages are clear and to the point, tailored to Charles II's notoriously brief attention span. Evelyn believed he'd caught his interest on the Thames that day, quotes, commanding me to prepare a bill, being resolved to have something done in it as he noted exultantly in the diary entry for 1st of October, 61. Evelyn remembered that promise of action. The king did not for an instant. Silver, the larger work he mentions, began life as a presentation to the Royal Society, of which Evelyn was a very early fellow, in October, 1662. The handsome book published in 1664 was the first to appear under the imprimatur of the Royal Society. Evelyn included contributions from many fellows and correspondents. Over time, it grew considerably, but remained steadfastly practical, surveying and discussing trees in all their species, variety, and uses, and taking many of the um, earliest uh, statements of the uh, first edition and expanding on them um, in the end. In, in numerous different editions. But the capital was not dependent on wood for fuel. London's tortuous relationship with supplies of sea coal from Newcastle on Tyne mirrors our own troubled relationship with oil, hinging on supply, cost, and taxation. Scarcity and high prices presaged polit political volatility. During the winter of 1643 and, 16, and, and four. Royalists supporting Newcastle would not ship coal to Parliamentary in London. The embargo cleared the atmosphere, that was physically, but manufacturing was on its knees, and artisans and the urban poor were always the losers in these ructions. The parallel with lockdown London in spring 2020 are also inescapable. When the uppity Dutch sailed up the Medway in June 1667, the coal fleet which turned out to constitute a, a third of all English merchant shipping, was as vulnerable as its naval counterparts. Evelyn believed that domestic coal was hardly responsible for pollution, since, quotes, culinary fires were weak and less often fed below. His outrage was directed at noxious trades, such as brewers, dyers, soap and salt boilers, 
lime burners and the like, which were, without exception, he thought, in the wrong place. There had been attempts at zoning, such as the removal of some urban breweries and a bill in 1657 which ordered brick and lime kilns to be located five or six miles outside the city. This is Holler uh, looking east. You can see London Bridge. Um, and it is an interesting um, observation that I just reached as I was making a selection of images that you hardly see cloud. You hardly see this smoke. And, of course, it gives huge folk focus to Evelyn's language. Evelyn was confident that there would be enough to deal with the problem once... Sorry, I didn't... Evelyn was confident that the problem could be dealt with once the sources of the offending smoke, which he enjoyed comparing to, quotes, Mount Etna, the court of Vulcan, Stromboli, or the suburbs of Hell, were diverted well beyond royal, partially royal at least, Greenwich, somewhere probably out around Woolwich. It has been argued that Evelyn's smoke in Fumifugium is figurative. On that reading, cleansing the smoke-filled corridors of Whitehall marked the end of the Commonwealth and the reinstatement of the monarchy. But his animated, angry text is surely one of urgently required strategy rather than royalist metaphor. Hence, its numerous reprints and continual applicability. Rather, as William Cavett writes, it can be seen, quotes, as a restoration attempt to re-establish order through innovation and transformation. How ironic that London, vulnerable, filthy, and unhealthy as it was when Evelyn wrote his fierce little tract, was turned to smouldering rubble by flame rather than fiery words. In Fumifugium, Evelyn recommends the relocation of industry, the control of city expansion, and the greening of the surroundings, all of which talk to our own concerns. The regular town, encircled by thick plantings of trees and fragrant shrubs, was a prototype green belt. It was for delight to help feed the people there and to replenish stocks for the essential woodlands that would form part of it. The emphasis on beauty underscored with, sorry, the emphasis on utility underscored with beauty and, and thereby scent and orderliness is echoed by John Claudius Lord Loudon's Hints for Breathing Spaces for the Metropolis of 1829. Also by Octavia Hill's campaigns for greater park spaces, especially to the east of London, and of course um, that led to the founding of the National Trust. And in Ebenezer Howard's Tomorrow, A Peaceful Path to Real Reform, published in 1898, quickly reissued as Garden Cities of Tomorrow in 1902. I'm sorry. I, uh, hmm. this, is, this is the unruly city, and that is Ebenezer Howard. Sorry, I'm <laughs> caught out by that one. So Ebenezer Howard's programmatic approach, which became, of course, the garden city um, of Letchworth, the first garden city, rather less so the second garden city at Wellin, garden city, um, is demarcated according to function, and that is a diagram from his publication. Um, it's in both publications, but this is the um, uh, a further, uh, further worked up one, and you can see on the outer edge group of slumless, smokeless cities. Slumless, smokeless cities was really exactly what Evelyn was arguing for. And um, within the uh, different sectors, uh, you have an astonishing variety of um, both um, industrial activities, uh, social um, uh, homes for waifs, homes for inebriates, epileptic farms, large farms, um, and, and more, uh, College for the Blind, um, nothing is forgotten, um, both in social, uh, industrial, and, of course, um, within those uh, little roundels, of course, people are living the pink um, round in the centre, 
his population 58,000. Anyway, that's Ebenezer Howard's version. The control of urban growth by designated open space drove Greenbelt legislation in the mid-20th century. Evelyn's long and benevolent shadow falls over all of these. On publication, he pressed his trifle, which is, I'm still talking about Fumi Fujim here, on close associates and influential friends, such as the leading scientist, Robert Boyle. The subtitle quotes, the inconvenience of the air and smoke of, the, of London dissipated, was followed by, quote, some remedies humbly proposed. 20 years later, tellingly, he misremembered that subtitle, writing to Dr. Robert Plott, fellow of the Royal Society and keeper of the Ashmolean Museum. He called it Fumifugium, or a prophetic invective against the air and smoke of London with its remedies. His humble proposals had turned to prophetic invective, surely forged out of frustration. In 1688, he assured his good friend Samuel Pepys that he had sent, quotes, the old smoky pamphlet you desired, which, had it taken effect, might have saved the burning of a great city. They were discussing relevant laws, but Evelyn couldn't remember any statutes that had been applied to London. After the 66, 1666 fire, the message in Fumifugium was restated and refined for a third time in his unpublished Londinium Redivivum, apologies for the Latin, which accompanied his plan for the city of London, which was highly diagrammatic, um, bore a lot of resemblance to um, the, plans, uh, the plan of Christopher Wren, and um, in a sense was the uh, illustration to the text he was writing, which of course wasn't published, so it, it sat alone. He wrote that a cleared site for a new city would allow for the recycling of, quote, useless and cumbersome rubbish, maybe even the building of a new quay with waste material. Recycling, you see. He suggests, in inverted commas, necessary evils, slaughterhouses, fishermongers, and the same old lot, brewers, bakers, dyers, and soap makers, be moved out, perhaps to a waterside at Bow or Wandsworth, or beyond city boundaries in Islington or Spitalfields. Reused brick could use, be, be used for paving, while waste pipes should be immured in plaster of Paris for cleanliness. Evelyn's planned London was perhaps informed by his role, taken since in, on in 1662, as one of 21 distinguished commissioners for London streets, although the commission itself had been overtaken by events. In 1664, so this is of course before um, plague and fire, Evelyn was swept into a prestigious and purposeful official role as one of the four commissioners for the sick and wounded and prisoners of war, a role in public service which required efficiency and action. It played to different and active sense of strengths in Evelyn's character and experience and led to his major involvement in the establishment of both Chelsea and Greenwich hospitals over the coming decades. At home in the garden, atmospheric pollution was finding optimum conditions in a succession of harsh winters, and none was worse than 1683-4. Evelyn's precious Says Court was laid waste. Over London, and he writes, the excessive coldness of the air hindering the ascent of the smoke was so filled with the fuliginous steam of the sea coal that hardly could one cross the road, the street, he said, sorry. And of course, what he's actually describing is a sort of a, a, a lid uh, which had, has, has come into play so that the pollution is pressed down by another layer. <clears throat> and of course, under this is this ferocious cold. He described the fate of his garden in a letter to the Royal Society, which was published in full in the Philosophical Transactions, which was the magazine of the Royal Society. And he offered advice about tending injured plants, very much as if they were sick patients, um, very much as if they were the sick seamen who he had been responsible for um, earlier, if that's not a little exaggerated. But his account ended with the poignant discovery of his tortoise, self-buried as usual for winter hibernation, but now dead. <clears throat> 
So this is the um, this is the official portrait of um, Evelyn by Nella, which was um, commissioned by the Royal Society and is in their possession still, and dates from uh, the late 18, uh, 1670s. Um, and what does he have in his hand? Well, of course, he has silver. Um, and just um, to clarify, silver is usually published, was usually published, um, with the title written as YLVA, but for some unaccountable reason, the edition of 1706, which was the year of his death and the one to which he was, on which he was still working, um, is S-I-L-V-A. Perhaps he didn't have time to talk to the publishers before um, everything was, um, the die was cast. So that's it. And interestingly, that's um, an early um, rendering of Evelyn. It's after um, a um, print um, by Nante, well, it's after a, a wonderful uh, drawings which are still owned by uh, members of the Evelyn family and which I reproduced in my book. Uh, and those drawings are both um, John Evelyn, Mary Evelyn, and also his parents-in-law. However, this has sort of been slightly um, coarsened in the telling. And um, I think it's, it's rather touching somehow that the very young Evelyn is captured on the frontispiece of Silver, published in 1706, at which point he was 86 years old, but still writing. The, subject, the subsequent history of Fumifujim is, t is telling. In 1772, the Reverend Samuel Pegg the Elder, an obscure antiquarian, reissued it, possibly prompted by a major financial crisis that year. Downturns tend to favor radical ideas and fresh starts. It had been Evelyn's misfortune to success, he says, Pegg says, to suggest, quotes, a work of such consequence to so negligent and dissipated a patron. And that is, of course, Charles II. And the Reverend Pegg further pointed to the enormous growth of industry in the intervening period, coal-fired, centrally located, and he even includes what he describes as the fire engines of the waterworks, which were perhaps even more dangerous in their pollution than useful in supplying water. The terrible evidence of bills of mortality for infants and children also pointed to the real toll, which was from atrocious air quality. Again, it seemed Evelyn's still timely ideas might help to mitigate the horror. But as the decades passed, the situation merely worsened. William Upcott's edition of Evelyn's miscellaneous writings, which was in 1825, brought him back to attention. And this is the period in which people um, in general uh, became aware of Evelyn's uh, work again and an edition, Bray's edition of the diaries uh, were added to that. And the diaries, I should perhaps just say as an addenda, um, are very rarely are they um, immediate um, comments. They're very, in, in general, and there's a wonderful scholarly edition and, and um, De Beer who did the, uh, this edition, uh, has traced you know, the sources for all sorts of things that he wove into the words and the pages of his diaries. So it's a little bit misleading to think of them as diaries, and of course they always lack um, the brio and, uh, and the fine, wonderful um, uh, etching, you could say, of Pepys's diaries. They are a very, very different kind of document, but just occasionally he comes jumping out um, and that moment when his father-in-law um, is left in Paris when his wife has died out of the blue um, is one such. There are quite a few moments in the early days. Um, latterly, he does tend to um, expand on the sermon that he heard um, the week before, and you can lose him. And I'm losing you. So <laughs> as the decades pass, the situation continued to worsen. That's the pollution. But with Upcott's edition, 
the monthly review noticed that Fumifugian's em emphasis on the purific purification of the London atmosphere as well as the great panacea for the, for the purpose, was planting. And perhaps that prompted Loudon's diagram for urban growth bound by what he called breathing spaces, which was surely a leaf out of Evelyn's book, as were his very important proposals for garden cemeteries to be beyond city boundaries. The 1706 edition of Silver, this one, proposed a mile-long gated single burial ground to the north of the city and in its text also reminded readers of the author's Fumifugium, lest they had forgot. There's a little asterisk and it's in the margin. And a lot of the language um, and the statements are very close to the ones from the 1660s. Or 1661, I should say, in particular. And soon after that, Wren was, in fact, promoting ideas for extramural burial grounds with great energy to the commissioners. Um, and this is thought to be the very first such in London, which is um, St George's Gardens in um, Hoburn or Bloomsbury, whichever you want. Um, and it still has, uh, in its, with its um, surrounding walls, which are thought to have been... Uh, possibly modelled on something that Hawksbourne drew up. Um, this, is a, this is the space, um, the kind of space that was um, being suggested. And of course, it was well outside London when it was laid out. So this idea of um, the burial uh, of huge numbers of people, um, obviously at the plague, but uh, with uh, waves of uh, infection and so on, was, it, it was incredibly important. Uh, that these locations should be secured. Um, and that's a very interesting example. And, of course, plays to the current need for small open spaces as, um, as we are, are confined closer and closer to home. Um, and they are what Octavia Hill, who herself had a great interest in John Evelyn, um, what she termed outdoor sitting rooms. In the 1680s, the statistician Sir William Petty, who was another fellow of the Royal Society, had painted a hellish vision of the exponential view of the growth of the capital, leading to a continual series of plagues, calculating that the population would be nearly 11 million by 1840. A little exaggerated. Petty guessed that only some 200,000 would live elsewhere. Evelyn's admiration for Petty knew few bounds. If I were a prince, he wrote, I should make him my second councillor, at least. There's nothing difficult to him. There's nothing impenetrable to him. Many things were difficult for Evelyn, and many things were impenetrable, and much of what he wrote is impenetrable. So how, how ironic it is that Evelyn's writings have so outlasted Petty's. In 1930, Fumifugium re-emerged into print, to support the case against the sighting of Chelsea, that is, Lots Road, power station on the Thames. Here at last, you see smoke on the, uh, in, a, in an image. This was a, um, by Donald Maxwell, um, and it just shows the, perhaps the um, imagined level of pollution that those tall chimneys were going to um, bring into play. And, it's quite ironic, really, looking at that, because one of the, uh, one of the sort of medium um, palliatives to the 17th century pollution was to just build chimneys higher so that you could lift the whole thing. Well, actually, what goes up comes down. Not such a great idea. Fumifugium received a thoughtful review in its 1930 um, Reemergence in um, Nature, um, I think not the same magazine, uh, by someone initialed RR. At intervals, more editions followed under the aegis of um, the Society, the, sorry, the National Society for Clean Air, which was itself the successor to the Smoke, sorry, the Coal Smoke Abatement Society. Too many words in these which was founded in 1898 by the painter Sir William Blake Richmond. And I think that's interesting that it was a kind of visual um, notion that drove, or it was, a, it was a painter and people whose 
who were offended. It's not a doctor, it's not, um, it's not a scientist, it's a painter who thought that coal smoke was such a, a, a blight. The Clean Air Act was not passed until 1956, and there was another in 1968, following the great smog of 1952. And that led um, to the deaths of uh, 12,000 people. This is actually a slightly earlier smog, and it's the Palace of Westminster. Um, just, um, I think, probably it was most days like that during the winter, uh, during that decade after the war, um, and, and probably well before it as well. In a further twist, it was found that lack of light and direct sun led to, to rickets in children, so it was another different health hazard. The impact of what was known as dark smoke was profound, and its effects quite as real as the swirling smoke that Evelyn had described in the corridors of Whitehall. I think not metaphor, but reality. Evelyn was 80 when his birthplace, Wooden, became his last home by rights. That's a very early, that's, that's a drawing by him. Um, and uh, I think it gives a very good uh, impression of the, of the kind of terrain because, uh, and to this day, it's, it's nestled, it's in the Surrey Hills, it's in a very, the landscape is highly protected now, glad to say, uh, and all around the wonderful, wonderful woods. Uh, and uh, certainly the last time I was in the area, I noticed that a number of the beech trees had little sort of necklaces on and they all said property of the Evelyn family, which I rather like. Anyway, um, at this point, the woods were a source of income. And of course, um, because there was business there and these two buildings in the foreground are mills which were being used for some kind of processing, uh, charcoal was of the essence. And so although um, Evelyn always described himself as born of the woods uh, or words to that effect, um, his family were also, um, they were eating away at the woods. So it was quite a delicate balancing uh, act. In 1703, a massive hurricane wreaked havoc on the, on the standing timber that his forebears had planted and begun to cut down recently to meet their debts. But as usual, he dealt with the disaster by writing. He added valuable yeah, sorry, he added valuable new and old material to silver and wrote memoirs for my grandson, which was, um, to come, which was written in 1704, but not in fact published until Geoffrey Keynes published it as a non-such press edition in 1926. Geoffrey Keynes was a great admirer of Evelyn's writings um, and he also published um, Acetaria, I never, perhaps Acetaria, uh, which is the Discourse of Salads, um, and designed, as Evelyn put it, for people who had a herby diet. So it comes to um, uh, modern views of diet as well. Nothing, nothing was untouched here. Memoirs from my grandson covered every conceivable topic, indoors and out, from securing the safe to clearing the gutters, but always with strict economy in mind. Evelyn's family jewels were in his head, in his library and in the grounds beyond the windows. And he pressed young John, who soon became Sir John, as the heir of an unentailed estate to consider, quotes, the timely and most continual planting of woods and timber to which the soil is so inclined. In old age, Evelyn had become ever more alert to enlightened, conservation-minded management of woodland shamed by his family's careless exploitation of timber for industrial charcoal along the, the long, sorry, along the fast running Tillingbourne Valley, which was, um, I think it's about 12 miles long and it was absolutely full of uh, industrial enterprises, mills of every sort. Um, it's very hard to imagine when you go to the wonderful countryside around Wooten and Albury and um, there, that this, there was a kind of industrial revolution going on there in the 17th century and afterwards. Fortunately, Evelyn's grandson was everything that he could have wished 
in his care of Wooden, his modest demeanor, and his life of the mind. He became a fellow of the Royal Society and added a new library to the house. He died in 1763, aged 81, so he got the genes as well. John Evelyn's encyclopedic tendencies and prolix style worked against his zeal to be a reformer, let alone an intellectual powerhouse. But two books, The Brief Fumifugium and The Ever-Expanding Silver, had endearing and purposeful afterlives. On the 400th anniversary of his birth, on October the 31st, they are undoubtedly his most effective memorial. And we must share Evelyn's burning sense of urgency. Yet, like the feckless King Charles II, our leaders don't bother to keep their promises, even when they make them. Surrounded now by mostly unseen but deadly hazards, we're, we're reaping the whirlwind. Surprisingly enough, Evelyn's voice is entirely of the moment. Gillian, thank you very much for a really interesting lecture. We do have a few questions, if that's all right. Um, one of them refers to, one of the first ones that was posed refers to the library that you referenced at the end of the lecture. Um, the questioner says, in 1977-78, John Evelyn's library was sold and dispersed. Do you know how much was lost, what remains to be discovered? Is, do you have a view on the library? I have a view, as I think probably <laughs> an absolute majority view, anybody who looked in that direction was that it was the most terrible thing to have done. Um, what drove it, I don't know. I mean, um, the family um, was not on its absolute uppers. But I think it was an encumbrance. And right. um, it was before, I mean, it predates the lottery. There's, um, I think, some money from the National Memorial, um, Heritage Memorial, whatever it was called in those days, came into play. But it, it was the most astonishing um, uh, amount of, of uh, I mean, the library went, but furniture went and, and artifacts went, all sorts of, uh, you know, it, it kept on rolling. And it was a very, very open wound. When I first went to an, uh, an event involving Evelyn, um, you know, it was, it was very raw still. And that was 30 years on, mm. just about. Uh, so I don't know how many um, fine, um, I mean, I, I think, I mean, let's imagine, I think he, he may have had a Robert Hooke's micrographia. Right. I'm pretty sure that that was never identified, and I don't think that went into, I mean, the, the national collections did everything they could. Evelyn's Cabinet of Curiosities went to the Jeffrey Museum, um, and I used to go and visit it once or twice, and then it disappeared, and I had a little discussion with the then director, and where's it gone? And of course, the Museum of the Home, as it now is, wanted much more interaction, children, you know, working with things and getting a sense of period um, by other means, and so it went off as, you know, an object in a study collection. Right. So you've got all these different sort of levels mm. of, of um, you know, there isn't an Evelyn house into which you could place these things. Um, you know, there's, uh, Wharton is a conference centre. Before that, it was a training centre for Surrey Fire Brigade, I think. It didn't have, it was precious little left there. Um, so it, it but, but to look on the bright side, the manuscripts, uh, and that was a separate event. I'm a little rusty on exactly how, how it went. Um, the manuscripts, of course, went to the British Library. Right. And from that, um, they... Um, sorry, the manuscripts didn't. They went to Christchurch. They went to Oxford. And then they went to the British Library. And when they were there, um, Francis Harris, who was in charge of the manuscripts room at the time, did the most glorious catalogue. They are wonderfully catalogued. Um, and they are, I mean, I was the beneficiary, you know, just sort of 
got to the end, I think, when I started, and it was, and I nervously asked Francis if she thought I was <laughs> biting off more than I should. Um, it's a fantastic uh, collection, and it's, it, you know, it was entire. So, um, um, it's, it's, it's a checkered story, really, but I suppose it could have happened much earlier and to much worse effect, and there are all sorts of sort of old wives' tales about and William Alcott got a terribly bad press because he went, he sort of went to see a suggestible old lady at Wooten and, and charmed his way. He was, a, he, <laughs> tellingly, he was an autograph hunter, so he liked letters, particularly like the signatures at the end. And um, he sort of apparently um, wormed his way into her uh, company and, and was quite um, light-fingered with um, some of the things yes. he saw. Uh, but he also looked into, or was shown drawers which were lined with, you know, <laughs> manuscripts and letters from, you know, John, as he was known in the family, Silver, Evelyn's correspondence. So, what to do? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, plague and pest houses. Did Evelyn write about these? It was thought beneficial to smoke for, that smoke would ward off miasmic smells. So how did his view on the smoky environment link with the, these beliefs about smoking and burning of fires? Um, well, I think, I mean, that's not really anything. I mean, he, the beginning of Fumi Fujim is, is much about health, but it's very, it's really quite a, it's the rambliest bit, and he's threading all the different things through it. Um, as a assiduous attender of Royal Society events and a reader of um, philosophical transactions, um, he would have known what the theories were. Um, I mean, I've, it, it's interesting that your question now mentions miasmic, because I was having a conversation um, both at home and <laughs> elsewhere as to when that term actually came into use. I don't think that Evelyn used it, but I might be wrong. I mean, if, if you realised <laughs> how dense Evelyn's writing no, is, sure. I could easily uh, have missed the use of miasma. But it, of course, comes into its own much more so in the 19th century. Yeah. And I sort of, I, I, my line to miasma, in a way, is I wrote a biography of Octavia Hill and her grandfather, Dr. Thomas Southwood Smith, um, was one of the Board of Health who were dealing with a huge, um, well, several cho cholera epidemics, crises, um, and they were still um, dealing in miasma theory. Miasma was it. Mm. It was, you know, it was all in the air. And it, it wasn't, of course, until um, the doctor, John Snow, went to the water pump in Soho and uh, it all came out of the water. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the actual word, I, I, sorry, I've diverted really from the question, which was could smoke. Um, I, I, I mean, at one point he's, he's very um, dismissive of the idea. Somebody suggests that you could send a boatload of um, peeled onions down the Thames and they would um, dispense, disperse uh, fumes and thus dispense with germs, and he thought that was a very silly idea. Um, but of course, he was a long way from any kind of medical proficiency, and his own circle didn't really include any of the great medics of the day. It was much more, uh, it was many more chemists and um, different kinds of scientists. Uh, that leads on to this, this next question, actually, Good. about his role and reputation in the early years of the Royal Society. Um, the questioner says that, according to the fellows list, his profession is listed as virtuoso, and his field of interest researches are arboriculture and horticulture. What do you think about these labels? Well, I know about his feelings about virtuoso, and I wonder if that came to haunt him, because, of course, when... Um, there were several extremely um, satirical plays put on which poked um, merciless fun at uh, the early fellows of the Royal <laughs> Society. 
and Evelyn found himself portrayed at least once, I think more than once. And the word virtue as it came as a sort of stick to beat him with. So he was very, um, and of course, you know, it is a word that could be used, I mean, even now you could sort of see how it could tip mm. different ways. Um, I think in the early days, you know, he was one, there were enormous numbers of, of thoughtful, busy men of the shires who were sending letters in and sending, I mean, if you look at the philosophic tra transactions, it's a sort of extraordinary sort of heaving, you know, it's a sort of beehive of observations and ideas and uh, collected, um, I was going to say trivia, but not necessarily. Mm. Which I suppose if you were someone like Boyle or Wren or any of the considerable figures, many of, you know, of whom were the leaders in their individual fields, they would perhaps have had a bit of a chuckle. I think that, I think Evelyn was so busy um, accruing his knowledge. I mean, in some areas he just got terribly out of his depth. And of course, his um, his translation of uh, Lucretius was was the famous one, De Rerum Natura, which took up a lot of his time in the 1650s. Um, but um, I think well, that was, of course, pre royal society. But he he's um, he was listened to respectfully, as far as I uh, as far as I know. He was a great arboriculturalist. He was a great horticulturalist. I mean, uh, the, you know, the limits of, of my topic meant that really the um, uh, Evelyn the Gardener has been squeezed almost out of the picture. But I, I was thinking also um, in the matter of the death of the child um, and those late years of the late 50s, the garden was, I mean, clearly w was his therapy. I mean, he was indulging in something which he loved to do um, and, and the same, in fact, when you know, they first arrived at um, Sayers Court and he was trying to keep his father-in-law's spirits up. So that gardening was, I mean, it wasn't just a sort of, um, he, he wasn't uh, cataloguing, he was, he was using um, the growth and the habits of nature and, and uh, his observations um, on a much wider sphere. And I think that's, Again, it has a very sort of contemporary ring as we look to, um, you know, ju just the beneficial yeah. elements of, of a green landscape in hard times. Yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, the the the, na the, the actual horticulturalist, arboriculturalist, um, you know, he was. He was a damn good etcher, <laughs> but he only <laughs> did, you know, he said there's only two, two little sweets. He didn't have time or, um, you know, he probably had inclination, but he didn't have time for that. So there were many, many things that he touched on and, and didn't take any further. But I think that's fine, but I don't think he would have been happy with Virtuoso remaining on the page. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of our audience members is wondering, um, was Paris really so much more pleasant environmentally than London at the time? Um, Napoleon III, of course, much later, was inspired by the UK to, produce, to introduce large parks. Was it that, was Paris not using coal? I think it was, I, I did um, intend to have a very good look at where um, industrial activity mm. occurred in Paris. And my, um, my memory is that it was much further out. And I, I mean, that's a rather interesting observation when you think of Paris and London today, because Paris has always kept its uh, office content in a completely separate box mm. from where people live and where the cultural life goes on and so on. And I suspect that because, of course, you had you know, a king who was um, being very absolutist and uh, Paris was you know, a mirror of, um, <laughs> of the Roche Soleil, so it was, <laughs> it was everything that he could possibly um, show. And, and I'm sure it had a modicum of, of pollution, but uh, you know, it was domestic and not industrial. And, of course, you know, the Seine is... Um, has many sort of, well, has a 
huge length, and I think people live much more, um, ha had a much more kind of utilitarian view of the river, um, beautiful as it was, as it, you know, because it goes underneath, um, oh, it sort of cuts through the, the, the escarpment outside Paris, so it's a landscape feature, but it's also, it's a working, I mean, it, it was the working river in the way that um, I think the, the the whole sort of setting of the Thames was so execrable by all accounts. You know, the actual approaches, and it's interesting that comment about making a key so that people could get to the river, because even that was difficult. You know, dirty, mm. you know, muddy steps and and just just filth. Um, so I, I think because Paris was the, it, you know, there it was. It was the show. It was the shell mm. for that monarch. Um, and that was physical and literal as opposed to <laughs> metaphorical. Interesting. Um, last one. Would you say that Evelyn's care for the environment was mainly based on his love for gardening and the beauty of nature, or did he believe in the intrinsic value of the environment? It's kind of putting a modern spin on on what he what his priorities were but well i think i think the the latter in the sense of everything being so interconnected and that's what mm. uh, as i was sort of going through his writings with this slant um as opposed to other reasons that i've read his writings um it does um i mean even silver in its in its fullest form you know is it, of course, it is um, section by section, different kinds of trees and, and so on, but it, it's it extraordinarily diverse and everything, um, everything sort of scrolls out of that. And of course, I mean, I shouldn't uh, overlook the fact that he, he considered himself to be a very spiritual man and, you know, that idea of the wider environment was, you know, it's God's earth. Mm. Um, and we might not find that, you know, is tallies with the idea of environmental consciousness, you know, if, you know objecting to the root of HS2. It doesn't come across as, you know, as a spiritual issue, but let's just go back yes. <laughs> uh, at least 300 years. Um, and I think, I think that's... Um, I think he saw the interconnectedness of it all and... and as I was saying before, the idea of the emotional um, sucker uh, that a, a good landscape or fine planting or, you know, even, even this really sort of, really, by all accounts, you know, the, the garden they made at Say's Court, of which there really is no image except this very idealised and very misleading plan, which I decided not to show because... We don't really know how much of that ever occurred. Um, you know, people people came, people visited. The king came. You know, I mean, it was a very, very highly acclaimed piece of semi, well, mostly French horticulture brought to this mm. to these shores, and it was very, very unpromising, and it was an extraordinary achievement. Um, so, you know, he could magic. Um, he knew how to sort of uh, magic something out of almost nothing in that case, whereas his home at Wooten was already just the most blessed spot. And he just, um, in, 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 you can see the, the elements of kind of a bit of Italian garden that he did <laughs> to sort of, I think his brother kind of gave him these little sort of, not so little, um, tasks, you know, make, make our garden a bit more like Albury, which um, was the, the grand one down the road. Um, and the Italianette thing was, you know, if you can't go to Italy, then make it in your backyard if you can. And that's, of course, so Italianette. Um, and, um, you know, so there's memory and there's uplift and there's um, a connection, as I say, between just lots of different aspects of um, how man goes through his life, you know, here. Well, then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for being so generous in answering so many questions um, and for a wonderful lecture. And thanks to our audience for attending. Um, I would like to alert you to some upcoming lectures. 
On Monday, the 2nd of November at 1 p.m., Murray Pittock, Professor Pittock, will be te uh, speaking about Bonnie Prince Charlie. On Tuesday, the 3rd of November at 6 p.m., our Professor of the Environment, Jackie McGlade, will be talking about connected nature. And on Wednesday, the 4th of November, our provost, uh, Simon Thurley, will be continuing his series with a talk on ruling passions, the architecture of the Cecils. So please do join us for what promises to be a really interesting week. Thanks very much. <laughs>